I don't know whether he does now, but I doubt it. At least at that time, he was president. Clinton doesn't know how to type. And the staff knows that he doesn't know how to type. So Clinton doesn't want Morris to put the draft into the White House computer because then the staff would figure out that it wasn't his draft. So he hunted all day through the residence for a manual electric typewriter, something from the Stone Ages. They find this dusty IBM Selectric. Blows off the dust. And Morris says, I'm sitting there typing the draft of the speech. He's standing over me, kind of half dictating, half saying, then I want to go here. I want to go there. Something was wrong, and the advisors to the President of the United States knew it. They picked up on the little signals. He was arguing, finding fault with their proposals, and bringing up points that no one had discussed. Kept referencing needing a centralized strategy. And there were silent but visible clues. Washington hands are like bloodhounds when it comes to picking up the scent of changes in political influence. And in a White House, that means access to the president and the president receiving and listening to your ideas. According to advisor George Stephanopoulos, the crib notes that fell out of Bill Clinton's folder during White House meetings more than once were signed. He's not just writing his own ideas, he's receiving them from someone else on a telephone call and writing them down. They were boldly inked. Stephanopoulos is looking at the strength of the squiggles for a sign. The notes usually had the most combative ideas. Then they'd notice when they were meeting with Bill Clinton, he'd leave and go to the study for a meeting with an anonymous caller. But the real telltale was when they spotted a yellow post-it note by his phone that said, Charlie called. Clinton was withdrawing for Stephanopoulos, Harold Ickes, Stan Greenberg, and other veterans of the 1992 election that brought him to the White House. It was hard to escape now in 1995, the metaphor of jilted lover, particularly for Stephanopoulos, who got a little emotional in his memoir. I was presidential advisor in name only. My words no longer tipped the balance of a decision. The press joked he was Stefa fold envelopes. But it wasn't funny to him. Clinton came up with new speeches, different issue sets, a wild idea to spend millions on ads when there was no election going on. No one, not even a group of advisors in the White House who met and and literally disagreed with each other, no one had that idea. It's a waste of money, Icky said. Stephanopoulos feels the same way. Clinton authorizes it. Was he just being testy with his advisors? But it wasn't really a surprise totally to Stephanopoulos. When I was honest with myself, I couldn't blame him. I was part of the team that had failed him. With the Democrats in control of both the White House and the Congress, we were held accountable yesterday, and I accept my share of the responsibility in the result of the elections. Failed him meant the huge defeat in the 1994 midterms. I don't know what you're image of Bill Clinton is. It's such a a blank canvas. That's part of what we're going to talk about today. We can sell off entire operations the government no longer needs to run and turn dozens of programs over to states and communities that know best how to solve their own problems. For a lot of people, it might just be bitter hate or something like that, or just like creepy guy or hero. All of those things are possible with someone like him. But if you go back to 1994, we really have to change the range of emotions American voters had about him. The problems of this new world are complicated, and we've all got a lot to learn. That Rambling means- president, figuring the job out, low polls, not really convincing people with speeches, especially post-midterms, did not just lose the House in 94. He lost the House that Democrats had held as a party since 1954. And as I said in another podcast, from television to the internet, from no Super Bowls at all to like Super Bowl 25 to, and because of a leadership quirk, a new speaker, minority whip, Newt Gingrich was actually elevated and he was ready to fight. 
He was forceful in opposing Democrats all through the 80s and early 90s. Clinton also loses the Senate for the Democrats. They had held that since 1986. As I've said for years, it's not about moving left or right, but moving forward. And it's not about the next election either. That's in your hands. Meanwhile, I'm going to do what I think is right. He grasped to power now in the one office left, his own, offering to concede some Republican terms before they could do them. He apologizes for raising taxes too much. He incurs angry Democrats for that. Most speculation was that he would not be winning a second term. Really, if you go back to that 94-95 period, everyone was talking about it. A lot of people didn't think Clinton's getting a second term. And there are big, well-known names, Bob Dole, Colin Powell, that could take him out. He was asked if he was relevant anymore with a new Republican House and Speaker coming in and had to defend even the office of the presidency itself. This is all combined with the Cold War ending, which made the imperial president seem less imperial, at least at first. The media was moving on to the Republican Congress. It's a different battle with the media. At this era, you have, I'll get into it later, a lot of Democrats complaining about their media coverage and how the Washington Press Corps is a bunch of, you know, snotty little brats or things like that, or divas. Clinton well could have lost the 96 election, but a number of things happened, and we'll be talking about that today. Among the many things, an opponent didn't run. The economy ticked up. Uh, There were missteps from the opposition. New issues came to the front. Clinton got to make a major speech that people really liked. Before the election, all of the media polls were wrong, I believe deliberately. But among these other things, he changed his strategy and he brought in an old friend and didn't tell others about it. Yes, that Charlie on the post-it note turned out to be Dick Morris. And he wasn't just some old Democratic hand. Morris had been working with Republicans recently, including Trent Lott, who at that time was the minority leader in the Senate for the Republicans. Now Clinton's taking his phone calls at night about political matters. Clinton and Morris had a history. Not always a good one. And now they're at it again. The same media firms are now saying that Trump's approval has crashed during the impeachment period and as a result of the riot. And that uh, he's... But politically, they were of like minds. In phone calls, developing little phrases, takes on polls scribbled notes, on-the-fly ideas, reckoning of the American voters' minds by two people who seemed to a lot of outsiders not to really care about what the content is, just how to get to 60%. That may or may not be true. That was a very wide perception at the time. Morris with his pumping, non-stop voice on the phone, always confident, never was wrong in his opinion. So someone like a Clinton, highly intelligent, had to pick out where something was good and something was garbage. Here's what Bob Woodward said. Morris represented a side of Clinton that the president disliked in himself, the pragmatist who knew that a candidate needed to jockey and reposition himself to gain approval and win elections. But Clinton was always eager to be liked, and the attraction between Clinton and Morris was almost magnetic. Morris was this oddball political consultant, worked out of his house. We're talking about well before COVID. He didn't really spend a lot of time in Washington. He came from New York. He uh, had helped elect Gerald Nadler, who was still a congressman, uh, as his class president in Stuyvesant High School, New York City. Morris is one of those things that became very prominent in 70s, 80s, but particularly the 90s, the star consultant, although he did stay back a bit. The the consultant, the one who can read the polls, the ones who can make politicians say things to get elected. In September 1994, right before that midterm election, Dick Morris is campaigning in Connecticut for a congressman. This congressman's a Democrat, and Morris is really working exclusively for Republicans at this time. But it's his hometown, his own congressman. So as a favor, he's offering his services. The phone rings. And as Morris describes it, they say, it's the President of the United States on the phone. It had been some time since he had talked to Clinton, and he was trying to figure out how the Wilton, Connecticut Town Committee could vote on his friend's nomination for Congress. And 
Morris says, I was being levitated out of this and lifted up to a cloud when the president called. He had had occasional contact, met him maybe three or four times a year in 93 and 94, but he had nothing to do with his 92 election. That was a whole different team. And increasingly, Clinton wasn't listening to what advice Morris was giving. As Morris said, Clinton was going off in a direction of working only with those Democrats, and we kind of fell out of touch. But when there's moments before Clinton comes on the phone, Morris reconstructs in his mind the sort of exercise that he has to go through when he's talking to Bill Clinton. He's very smart, Morris says. He's very sharp, quick. He doesn't want small talk. You gird up for it. And if in the first five minutes after you meet Clinton, you don't mention something that he's done wrong, you've lost him. He's bored by what he's doing right. Clinton comes on. What do you think I should do about Haiti? This is where there's a situation with presidential succession in Haiti and a usurpation of the presidential office it's being negotiated. Might have to be an invasion. Why, Morris says, what are you planning to do? Well, we were thinking about the possibility of an invasion. So Morris says to him, you're invading the wrong damn island. I'm meaning Cuba. Talk to him in the first 30 seconds. You've got to oppose what he's saying. Morris tells him the frank news. The two most important forces in American politics are racism and isolationism. And if you incur casualties in Haiti, you just offended both of those. It was a kind of perspective no one had told Clinton. Morris knew that he got through to Clinton a little, but maybe not enough. But still for him, it was like being in love. It's all of a sudden there's this aura of stardust around you and you're no longer a mortal human being. I hung up the phone. I had a lot of difficulty figuring out what the Wilton Town Committee was doing after that phone call. But Morris had come in late in the 1994 midterm. Clinton had a successful Mideast visit and then went out on the campaign trail. He has a conference call with Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton. He says, you got to do something unique. Stop trying to sell the big achievements. Sell the small ones. They'll believe those. Clinton kept saying, if I tell them about all the jobs I've created, I tell them all the stuff I've done. And Morris tells Clinton, stop trying to get elected for the right reasons. They don't believe about jobs you've created. Hillary joins in, according to Morris's account. Bill, all you're doing is just trying to give them the big achievements. You're trying to justify yourself to history. Focus on the election. And then Morris says, Bill Clinton threw out the advice. And he calls a week before the election. How do you think it's going to come out? And I said, you're going to lose the House and the Senate. Senate, I can understand. No way I'm going to lose the House. And I said, I think you'll lose the House by 20 seats and the Senate by six. He told me I was crazy. And I I told him, can I send you a speech just in case it happens and I'm right so you know what to say at that point? And he said, Okay. And then the next thing, he was giving that speech after he'd lost both houses. Morris was now back in. He was a political advisor that could not just read a poll, but read into polls, said Mark White, the former Democratic governor of Texas. He was someone who felt that you could look at a few pages of the phone book. If there was one phone book for America, you could pull out one page and call people and get the opinion of America. You could find nuances in the language they use to describe stuff that might be secrets in what you should do in a campaign that the numbers may not tell you. But that leads politicians to wonder who uses services. Is he reading too much like a tarot card reader? And once you started him, you couldn't turn him off. He was a small sausage of a man encased in a green suit with white lapels, a wide floral tie, and a white collared shirt. His blow-dried pompadour and shiny leather briefcase gave him the look of a B-movie mob lawyer. But his outfit was offset by the flush of power on his pasty face. And he was missing a gene. No shame. Morris had Clinton all figured out, according to Morris. America is selling more cars than Japan for the first time since the 1970s. He is the end product of the debate between Democrats and Republicans in this century. That's the 20th century. By marrying the democratic doctrine of opportunity 
but we cannot go back to the time when our citizens were left to fend for themselves. To the Republican doctrine of responsibility. The era of big government is over. Clinton could achieve a Hegelian synthesis. Self-reliance and teamwork are not opposing virtues. We must have both. And on a personal level, this is as close as I'd ever get. I don't think there's an issue where Bill Clinton and I disagree. I just like him. I'm just like him. Being just like him has not stopped Morris from recently becoming exactly the opposite of what he was in nine, in the 90s, a friend to Bill and Hillary, an advisor to Bill and Hillary. He's been a right-wing talk show commentator. He's been on Fox News. He's been attacking the Clintons. He's written books. He literally wrote a book that rewrote Hillary's biography. Hers was living history. He wrote rewriting history. He's advised President Trump. There's talk of more of that. We'll get into that. Because he works so silently at times and also publicly in other ways, it's hard to tell where he's been, who's been listening to his advice, who he's been advising that might be acting a certain way because of his advice. If victory is ours tonight, I have been given something that few people get in life. A second chance. Starts in 1975. Clinton as a young man has just shocked the world. Well, the world of Arkansas politics. There's a fella here been talking some about being our next congressman. He's a new man. Bill Clinton is his name. When he comes close to being a congressman, Paul Hammerschmidt in a tough Republican county. Bill Clinton's ready. He's fed up too. He's a lot like me. He's a lot like you, Bill Clinton. You have to know that Paul Hammerschmidt gets 77% of the vote in the 1972 election. And Clinton nearly beats him in the next election. And he would just keep going. Bill Clinton's we might stop in a service station or a restaurant or whatever. He would want to meet the cooks. He would go back in the kitchen and meet everybody back there. He would not leave a place, I think, where he had not met everyone. Yeah, it's helped by Nixon. It's helped by Watergate that's happening in the 74 election. But this boy professor at the local law college charms the heck out of the Hill counties. Trucking coming trucking company presidents, little editors of small newspapers. He pushes the economic issue. One of his ads says, do you have enough money for green beans? He pushes the Nixon issue. He's not going to win, but they love him for trying. And then he almost wins it. Some say the boxes were stuffed against him. It's a tough district. It, it's the most Republican district in Arkansas at the time. Fort Smith, one of the key towns in the district, is extremely Republican. Clinton comes close to winning. If he can come close to winning there, he can win the state. He's now a star. In trying to decide what to do with his career and some combination of the decision between Bill and Hillary, they decide to go with some New York consultants, and Dick Morris is one of them. He does some small polls for him. When Bill Clinton becomes governor, he immediately pushes Morris away. He doesn't want to get involved in that anymore. He wants to be governor for the right reasons. One of the things that he does is implement a new roads program in Arkansas to improve the quality of the roads. He gets support from trucking associations when he's running for governor. He can pass the bill because there's a lot of support in the legislature from those trucking associations, from the companies that will end up building the roads, and generally from people who want to see Arkansas's roads improve. But there's a catch. In order to do it, to fund it, they have to raise the driving permit fee, the car tax. This is a key issue that's used against him, and within two years, the same year Carter's defeated in 1980, so is the youngest governor in America, Bill Clinton. In order to decide about how the strategy for the comeback, again, they return to Dick Morris. Dick Morris advises an apology. They film the commercial in a New York studio. Clinton apologizes. My daddy only had to whip me once. He apologizes for the car tax, says he'll do better. He becomes governor again. He's benefited by other things. His opponent lowered the car tax, but raised utility fees. They use that against him. Morris helps. In the Arkansas governor's race, our CBS News estimate is now that the Democrat, Bill Clinton, will, after all is said and done, have beaten Frank White 
the incumbent Republican governor of Arkansas and the man who replaced Clinton. A lot of politicians could benefit from Morris's advice, but he could also bite. And he did both to Clinton. And he can be right and he can be wrong. In 2012, Morris was thrown off Fox News for being wrong. He was wrong and he said, I was wrong at the top of my lungs. He predicted Romney would win the election. Obama, he said, would lose. Conservatives that watched the network wanted that to happen. And they were, of course, mad at anybody who predicted it when it didn't happen. He still insisted his opinion was correct, but that Hurricane Sandy had changed the election. The real issue is why Mitt Romney lost, he spun. The consultant star was a fad of the 1990s, but it always had been there. Gerald Rafshoon, you know, with Jimmy Carter. And if you go way back, images of the man behind William McKinley, Mark Hanna, the senator boss of Ohio, Colonel House, the intriguer behind Woodrow Wilson. But a good historical comparison to someone like Dick Moores is probably like William Frank McCombs, the Princeton grad who at just 30 years old helped Woodrow Wilson get that Democratic nomination, uh, even be a contender to become president and became his campaign manager. He would then annoy everyone on the staff, everyone in the Democratic Party. He was an alcoholic. He would make a book attacking Woodrow Wilson, attacking his staff and Colonel House making Woodrow Wilson president, take credit for his entire election, saying that Woodrow Wilson didn't even want to have the meeting that set him up for a presidential campaign, but that he insisted on driving him there. Another book about McCombs would call him President Maker. It's possible, it's possible uh, that McCombs was critical to Wilson, but once in office, Wilson gave him no position, McCombs would get a party position, but no position in the White House. And Wilson insists with a stenographer present, before we proceed, I wish to be clear to you, I owe you nothing. I will reserve the privilege of naming who I please to offices, McCombs wanted to say in that. It was a very similar conversation to assault on my vanity. Now, just like in 1980, Clinton's in a jam again. And the advice his advisor is giving him is not working. So Morris came, comes over to the White House secretly. All the appointment books say Charlie. Betty Curry, the uh, president secretary who would become a bigger figure during the Lewinsky hearings and all, you know, is not going to tell anyone who the president is visiting. It's just Charlie. I'd like you to work with me on the State of the Union today. And so, for a day, Morris comes over to the White House. And there's a thing to know about Clinton. He did, I don't know whether he does now, but I doubt it. At least at that time he was president. He didn't type. He doesn't know how to type. And the staff knows, Morris says, that he doesn't know how to type. So Clinton doesn't want Morris to put the draft into the White House computer. Because then the staff would figure out that it wasn't his draft. So he hunted all day through the residence for a manual electric typewriter, something from the Stone Ages. They find this dusty IBM Selectric, and some anonymous lugs it upstairs to his office, blows off the dust, and Morris says, I'm sitting there typing the draft of the speech. He's standing over me, kind of half dictating, half saying, then I want to go here. I want to go there. And I tried to put it into words, other words, what he was saying, or get his words. And as we finished each page, he would take it into his other room. He'd copy it over, left-handed, in longhand, so he could give it to his staff and say, I stayed up all night working on this. He longhands a draft to fool his own staff. It was his draft, Morris says. He was standing over me when I was typing it. Morris at one point looks at him and says, you know, this is what I wanted to do since I'm eight years old. And Clinton said, me too. The next day, the story all over the White House was that the president had stayed up all night writing the speech. So now, early to mid-1995, you're starting to get the trend that Stephanopoulos said he notices. The president's like throwing out prepared speeches that his staff's making, replacing it with more pugnacious ones. He's surprising his own party and submitting a balanced budget plan. Here's what Time Magazine said about uh, 
Morris and Clinton. Some aides venture that Clinton, known for having a restless mind, believes that he can gather the best ideas through a clash of conflicting views from different sources. One described that notion only half-jokingly as another form of the managed competition that Clinton proposed for the health care system last year. Morris by no means wins at every turn. He did not succeed in getting Clinton to refrain from laying down his first veto on a $16.4 billion spending bill. And some speeches he's offered for Clinton's Saturday radio addresses have been rejected. Then he decides to defy precedent and broadcast campaign commercials a year and a half before the election. Clinton knew that Republicans had beat him on his health care proposal with $13 million in advertising against it. It's a critical year for Clinton. He could have been another one-term president. We could have not really been talking much about him. I also think it would have furthered a trend that you heard a lot about at the time, particularly before his election, that Democrats can't win the White House. And if they can, that would have been perfect evidence that if they win in a fluke, Clinton, Carter, they can't hold on to it. But in 1995 and early 1996, he turns it around. The question that's important for a reason we'll get into is to isolate whether that turnaround is, as if Dick Morris was on this podcast talking to us, he would say, was him, or if it was other factors. It was perhaps the most difficult, roughly six-week period of my life. September 1995, Colin Powell's book comes out, My American Journey is in the windows of every bookstore, you know, back when there were bookstores. He didn't like writing the book much. He was much more comfortable in war rooms with maps of countries, trajectories of missiles, and OK Bravo Charlie on speakerphones. Now Powell dealt not with armies of soldiers, but armies of fans. Because I was torn by, do I have an obligation? People were pressing me on both do it and not do it. Five weeks, a grilling tour through 25 cities. Not in fatigues, not in a general's uniform, but in a suit with bright camera lights. The campaign for his book, My American Journey, was to the journals a campaign for the White House in stealth mode. But I wasn't. Or was it? Powell signed more than 60,000 books in five weeks. As Bob Woodward said, he struggled with the decision that he had to make. On one hand, he had the crowds, and he had the impression when he was on TV of a man who knew himself and his game, he was on track and in control in interviews. And the one thing that he decided that if he were to run for president, like everybody was telling him he should, it would have to be as a Republican. No independent, no build-it-yourself campaign apparatus. He'd have to go into the primaries of an established party. And that party was going to be the Republican Party. But there was a problem. Even as the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was taking orders. What did the president want? What did the civilian leadership want? What was he supposed to do? Now, it was what did he want? And it was a hard choice. He'd get up in the morning convinced that he should run for president and feel good for like 15 minutes and then think about all the bad things. To the extent, the voices of others mattered. They were there for him. Powell, per Time Magazine poll, would beat Clinton 46 to 38 percent. TV, news magazines, and newspapers kept talking about his phantom race for the presidency. There wasn't much web to speak of, 1995, AOL, you had a little. Everything, though, all the media forms pointed towards the man to watch. You have to filter out half of what Dick says. Clinton tells his chief of staff, Leon Panetta, who is concerned about all of the secret calls and the meetings. Now they're coming to him, Panetta, the staff, to ask how do we implement these speeches that Clinton's making that are contradictory from what our policy has been. He can get wacky, Clinton said, but I want him in. Panetta agreed. We can have him in, but he and the staff demanded that in meant in public, that he would be part of staff meetings. So it's important in assessing the influence of Dick Morris on Clinton's victory in 1996, or really in any consultant, is how much are they controlling the direction of everything? Is it just a little? 
And if the client is Bill Clinton, um, I wouldn't say that he's going to be anyone's puppets. Everyone said, Panetta, that the reason you beat George H.W. Bush in 92, among other things, was the process. The, the Bush campaign was not in sync with the Bush White House, and you were able to exploit those differences. We have to be different. Okay. So Morris would stop working from his house in Connecticut and go to Washington three or four days a week and integrate more with the staff. They'd have meetings. Still, Clinton's picked ideas for Morris continued to morph. Do we need big centralized bureaucracies in the information age? Often, we do not. He makes a speech against everybody else's suggestions in Warm Springs, Georgia, holy ground for Democrats, home of FDR, to challenge what could be said to be FDR's own ideas. FDR wouldn't have defended everything he did 50 years ago. For Panetta and for Stephanopoulos, the other aides, it was one of Morris's bad ideas that somehow got into the mix. For Erskine Bowles, who was a corporate type brought into the Clinton administration to better work with other corporations, corporate leaders, to provide some management from the loosey-goosey style of the early years of the Clinton administration. He understood this scenario. First of all, Bowles knew that Clinton just couldn't listen to the little cabal in the White House and get elected. That was one of the reasons Bowles himself was, was brought in. But The situation with Clinton and Morris was something he had seen before with other corporations, with CEOs. The CEO would often bring in a facilitator or a consultant to ask new questions of his executives and of him um, to get the executives forced to think. And, And that would often help CEOs to be able to drive results and to expand the companies in new ways. But Bowles thought Morris was an example of a consultant going too far, which he had also seen, taking silence from the CEO, in this case Clinton, as yes, and going ahead with an idea. So now it would need more of a structure. And With Bowles and Panetta talking to Clinton, they agreed on a structure. Morris would... Have meetings with Clinton, sure, but anytime there was a meeting without staff, then Gore and Panetta and Bowles and Ickes would meet without Morris with Clinton to follow up on those suggestions and to be sure that it was integrated into what they were doing on other fronts. And a dinner with Dick Morris and George Stephanopoulos was arranged. It didn't go too far to patch things up, but Morris suggested a great way they could work together. If Stephanopoulos simply listened to him and be the tactician of Morris's plans, as Stephanopoulos described it, it would be just like basketball. I'll be the policymaker, and you, George, you'll be the guy under the basket. Colin Powell, normally seen in that green uniform with all of those bars, contrasted with a fumbling neophyte clinging to the White House and angering even his own party with his contradictions. Powell was Clinton's major problem in the election, or so you would think. And Powell didn't pose the deadline to decide soon. Now, an important counter to Powell in 1995, as we're gearing up for the 1996 election, is not just Clinton, now boosted by some advice from Morris, dropping poll numbers for the Republicans in Congress, the contract with America, Newt Gingrich, etc. A counter to Powell was Bob Dole. Bob Dole was the majority leader of the Senate, decades of experience, more dull than Powell, but more seasoned than the occupant of the White House. Absent Powell, Dole would get the nomination. But if Powell ran, like Clinton, the Dole campaign was just as subject to the kind of gods of fate as to how it would turn out. Scott Reed running Dole's campaign figured that they'd just back off. Attacking Powell would be foolish. They'd Try to keep mainstream Republicans in. All of the senators that worked with Dole would probably stay with him. Significant governors in the Republican Party would back Dole in the primaries. 
they'd probably lose New Hampshire, but New Hampshire and, and in 1995 and 96, you're still talking about a period where New Hampshire mattered more than it did today. You didn't have that Obama example of losing the New Hampshire primary and winning the election. You did have Clinton himself, though, who had lost New Hampshire in 92, but kind of spun it as a win since the person that beat him was from the state next door. So New Hampshire still mattered. They knew they were going to take a beating there, and that was going to be a media story and a momentum killer. Maybe they could out-experience Paul, show him to be naive. And to this end, Reed did some things secretly, never would attack Paul in public. But they leaked polls that showed, you know, if you take Clinton out of the equation and just look at Republicans, Dole was among Republicans beating Powell 42 to 29 percent in their own confidential polls. A group of Republicans went out and had a press conference saying not only did they not want me to run for president, they didn't want me in the Republican Party either. And politically, I was in a box because on social issues, as you can imagine, I'm extremely liberal. But on foreign policy and national security issues, I'm rather conservative. The reason was, regardless of what Powell said about tax cut and he had cuts, and he had been on TV saying that he agreed with tax cuts, he was right in sync with the Republican right wing. Powell was seen by Republican voters as a moderate or liberal, regardless of what he said. Dole was seen as a conservative. They had a go-between, Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire, to go to Powell with Dole's poll. Rudman was Powell's friend. It was a friendly way of saying, this was not a, you know, we'll kick your butt if you get in this. This is just information that you want to make sure he knows before he makes his decision. Then you had those people who were attacking Colin Powell within the Republican Party. A significant conservative, Paul Weirich, said Powell was like the player in the Gilbert and Sullivan opera who had risen to ruler of the Queen's Navy by polishing the handles on the front door. Yeah, he really said that. Powell met with Newt Gingrich. And this is, see, you have to understand at this time, Gingrich takes over in 95, becomes Speaker of the House. He is the significant force in the Republican Party. So Powell is constantly being now contrasted and put in line with Newt Gingrich and the Republican Congress. And his positions are contrasted with Newt Gingrich's. Now, Gingrich meets secretly. Gingrich says, I have no problem with you, Colin. I will, not that I will support you, but I'll stay out of the way. And it can be a race between you and Dole. You're welcome to enter the Republican primaries if this is Gingrich's to give. But he did say, I think you should consider running and the toll it will take on you as a human being. Well, Colin Powell's own wife, Alma Powell, was dead set against running. Dead set against him running. Going back to the Clinton camp and Clinton and Morris. Now, Morris says that he did have a plan for Powell. And Morris says it came from him. It was Powell versus Powell. It was kind of going to be, will the real Colin Powell stand up? It would be his new positions that he's been stating that he's in line with the Republican Congress versus things that he said in the past. And that Powell would have to answer not just Clinton, but his own past positions. George Stephanopoulos, for his part, thought it would actually be great if Powell entered the Republican Party because primary because he couldn't win. Dole would win the primary by getting establishment conservative support, being the darling of the religious right in that race, then Powell would lose and the Republicans would have to answer for having defeated an American hero in their primaries. Personally, I'm not so sure if Stephanopoulos is right. You know, the whole idea of trying to get your best opponent or, or thinking about what is going to happen in your opponent's primaries um, is an old Washington game that lately has been more uh, publicized, but has always kind of been around. And it works sometimes. It works brilliantly sometimes to play in the other party's primary. And sometimes you get unintended consequences. I could very well see Powell having win the, Powell winning that primary anyway by getting enough Republican moderates and a some chunk of a group of conservatives that were willing to 
go with Powell in order to win the general election. And then you end up running against Powell, and is that still good? In any case, Powell made his decision quickly after his book tour ended at the end of 95, and personal reasons really took over here. One morning, I got up and had to face this again, and I put my feet on the floor and just said, this isn't you, it's not in you. So I went downstairs and told Alma that I was not going to do it. I was going to stop the speculation. And her simple reply was, what took you so long? (laughs) Well, that left Dole. And soon after, it didn't take long for Dole to lose some points, bragging about opposing Medicare. I was there fighting the fight, he told a group of conservatives. I was one of 12 to vote against Medicare. He then had to backtrack his statement, saying that he had favored health care. He just favored an alternative health care bill for seniors. There's something else to, to talk about in regards to 1996, and it's something that doesn't age well, because let me read you some statistics. Um, if you take the 2020 race and how much money was raised just by the campaigns alone, Donald J. Trump for president, $1.96 billion. That's between the RNC, Make America Great, Trump Victory, Save America, DJT for President, and Biden, $1.69 billion, Biden for President, DNC, Biden Action, Biden Victory, all of those funds. You're talking about nearly $4 billion, the official money in the presidential race. For Clinton, it was something like $85 million back in 94. 1996. And that, and it's probably going to top a hundred million by the time he's done, that was Herculean at that time. There is a limited internet. You're not going to get small money donors from internet until, really until the 2004 campaign in any significant way. But Clinton maximized the technologies and the fundraising strategies that he had. He be He was fundraiser in chief. Here's what Bob Woodward says in his book. If I were to write a script for a movie about Clinton's victory in 1996, I would begin with a scene depicted in this book, the December 27th, 1994 breakfast between Clinton and Terry McAuliffe, the Democrats' key fundraiser. You'll know McAuliffe later became governor of Virginia. McAuliffe issues a guarantee. He could raise all the money Clinton needed for these early ads that Morris wanted. McAuliffe didn't like the idea of the early ads, but hey, I could raise that money, $80 million, if you could get, if he could get access. Sir, I need to get people to see you. That meant, as Woodward described, thousands of quiet fundraising events under the guise of routine presidential outreach. Visits to the Oval Office from key fundraisers. Coffees. Hello, gentlemen. Have your checks been proffered? Mr. Smith, I didn't get your check. Cream? Sugar? Rides on Air Force One? Sleepovers in the Lincoln bedroom? Clinton used the DNC to go around the normal rules. Soft money donations of 25000 even 100000 could be had if it was run through the DNC. And that's what he did. One fundraiser in Atlantic City set all records. One million dollars for one appearance from the president. There were so many people, they couldn't even have the normal tables and chairs like they would in a normal fundraising dinner at that time. It was just rich people standing up. There were disagreements about how to spend that money. And we still can look back and have disagreements over the effect of that money. According to Morris, it was critical to put Clinton's poll numbers up by running ads in places like Illinois and Ohio and Minnesota and various Midwestern states about how cruel the Republicans were, mostly on the Medicare, Social Security issues. A little bit on guns. Yeah, attacking um Bob Dole for wanting to repeal the assault weapons ban. That issue was more live then. I guess it's still a live issue, but it was certainly a swing issue then. There's something else, though, to say about all of this. Those efforts were not wholly invisible, and they are to this day embedded in the image of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, just as Whitewater is. And the effect lasts. I mean, 
Clinton was seen as somebody who was selling the presidency. You know, that fundraising that he did, did get out. He had Gore and the the Buddhist temple story and things like that. Fundraising itself became an issue because they had to do so much to keep this strategy. Helped him, perhaps, in 96, change the long-term image. Now, I mean, it might be unfair in some ways. Candidates do just as much fundraising, even more now. But because of the new technology, they can get it through the internet. They can get it from small donations. They can get it from email solicitation. They no longer have to go to the contact. They still do, but they no longer have to make the entire presidency about uh, coffees and rides on Air Force One. It's worthwhile talking about media in 95, because I think we think that a lot of the media and the way that it's configured now, like where you have this kind of mainstream and then you have an alternative, perhaps social media, all these like alternative forms, and we think that's all new. But in the aftermath of the 1994 midterm, A lot of people were talking about a new form, which was talk show radio, because 70% of radio talk show hosts were conservative, and they were able to get stories to drive what the media was covering. When Joycelyn Elders put forth a proposal to legalize marijuana, she was out, and that was fueled by talk shows. Tom Foley, the Speaker of the House, and Dan Rostenkowski, one of the most prominent members of the Democratic House were both defeated in the 94 election. Talk show had a lot to do with it. In Tom Foley's home city of Spokane, there were three significant conservative talk shows constantly going at him. One of them, and asks him to answer allegations that he was homosexual. The allegations were made at that day by that talk show host with no cooperation at all. He was married to the same woman for 24 years. But even in the mainstream media, it's a very common assertion to make, and and it was made then too, media has it in for the Democrats, they like Democrats, and I think you have a a case to make, particularly with President Obama and some of the excitement about the the first African-American president coming in and, and things like that. It's a little less so with Clinton. We're losing some of the history at the time. I mean, look, this is what um, Jim Carville says, these media people think that they are the world. Paul Begala, another advisor to Clinton, says, the Washington press corps are so self-concerned that when George Stephanopoulos was moved from being the person giving the briefings to just advising the president, that was seen as the biggest emotion ever. George Condon of the Copley News Service, president of the White House Correspondents Association, told the Wall Street Journal earlier in 1995, a press corps that has been avoided and ignored and treated in a way that is Nixonian is not going to cut the president any breaks. Here's what the New York Times says. Why, for example, has there been so much unfavorable coverage of the essentially harmless phenomenon of the president inviting several Hollywood stars to the White House? Nightline did a story on Clinton's relationship with Hollywood. So did CBS News morning and evening. The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, All put Clinton Hollywood stories on page one. The reason could be, some suspect, is that the Washington press corps is upset about not being the stars as in Washington they should be. Here's the New York Times. Overall tone of press coverage of Clinton was about 30% more negative than it needed to be because of the animosity that it was felt towards Clinton and the people around him. The level of hostility in the press room was extraordinary. You have the story when Michael McCurry, press secretary, comes into the Oval Office and hands the president a big boxing glove. Who's it from? William Sapphire, sir. No, Clinton said. He called Hillary a congenital liar. This was true. Sapphire had called Hillary a congenital liar. Clinton got mad and through McCurry issued a response that if he were not president, he'd deliver an answer to Sapphire right on the bridge of his nose. It was a bad move. The public sided with William Sapphire against a president attacking the free press. Indeed, Sapphire strikes back having a field day on Meet the Press on Sunday morning. Host Tim Russert gives him a set of boxing gloves. And then William Sapphire gave one of those gloves to Mercury and said, said, do you think the president would sign one? 
Now McCurry was in the oval asking, No, I can't do that, Mike. I can't. I know I should. Should I? McCurry said, Well, he writes a column two times a week. We're gonna have to live with him. I honestly think he's trying to reach out. No. I just can't play the game. The boxing glove was returned, unsigned. Bob Dole was there to take on Powell if Powell ran, but there were others there to take on Bob Dole. In early 1995, a man named John Weaver checked into a small courtyard Marriott in the edge of Des Moines, Iowa. He didn't want to go into town. He didn't want to wear fancy clothes he might wear in Washington, D.C., where he worked as a political operator. He was very careful, because if spotted by reporters that he was in Iowa or by the Dole campaign, it would ruin his plan. His plan required stealth. It was to quietly organize for a candidate with just 3% in most of the opinion polls for the GOP nomination in 1996. And that was for Phil Graham, Texas Center. Despite the secrecy, Weaver had a team of 14, and he sent out five mass mailings to Republican voters around the state. and even in other states, and spent several hundred thousand dollars. His goal was to win in a relatively obscure event, or one that had been obscure, maybe a little more focused in 1996, the Iowa Straw Poll. A weird event. For $25, anyone can vote. They didn't even have to be from the state of Iowa. So the better organizer could get more people there, better rent name recognition, and win. Dole knew all about it because in 1988, he had done it to George W. Bush, and George W. Bush had done it to Ronald Reagan. Weaver and his volunteers made 40,000 phone calls to out-conservative the conservative candidate Dole. Dole's campaign was a little more complacent, but also had another factor. They couldn't win too big in the straw poll. They figured they'd get about 3,000 voters there. If they won too big, it would set up expectations for the Iowa caucus later, and if Dole didn't meet them... The negative stories would come out. Graham was exploiting this gap. Through Weaver's organization, Graham's people showed up. Dole's people did, but not overwhelmingly so, maybe about three quarters of what they planned. Dole gets up to speak, and he can tell when he's giving out his good lines that Dole supporters are not in the audience, not the way they were in 1988. The Dole people actually whisk him away to a hotel, and it turns out Dole gets not 3,000, but 2,582 votes in the Iowa straw poll. And Phil Graham gets 2,582. No joke. It's the exact same amount. An absolute tie. But Dole knew the truth. It was a fumble. Exactly what everyone was waiting for from the front runner in the race. A tie with Graham was a win for Graham. He did his best spin. I even seen a few people from Iowa there last night voting. But it hurt. Already in 1995, Dole had a loss. It wasn't just Phil Graham, though. Pat Buchanan was in the race. The commentator, former Nixon aide, columnist. Pat Buchanan liked Phil Graham. But he was running his own campaign, not supporting Graham's. And he got 18% in that straw poll. He was no nonsense. And Buchanan didn't care who he offended. He told Bob Woodward, I didn't divide the party. I just exploited the divisions in the party about him running against Bush in 92, where he came in a strong second in New Hampshire against the sitting president. Nobody cares what the Republican elders think anymore. It's about the voters. 
And Buchanan's new issue in 1996 was trade. He pointed out how the medium income of the average worker had gone down 20%, while the people who write books or do talk shows like me have gone up. Let me tell you, he told Bob Woodward, economic nationalism is coming to Europe and it's coming to the United States. Prescient words as we look at our politics today, and Buchanan goes on to beat Bob Dole in a New Hampshire primary. Doesn't get much farther, but does have that moment. A moment that he said his old boss Nixon would be proud of. Not that he and Nixon always saw it, I. Then there was Lamar Alexander. Lamar looked at it and said, okay, here's the race. Powell's out. Dole's Washington insider. Graham's another Washington insider. And Buchanan's kind of in the beltway. He's been around for a long time. Lamar's former governor of Tennessee. And he wore his red flannel jacket. And with ads that just said, Lamar! Exclamation point. Making it clear that he was the anti-Washington choice, or at least he wanted to be. It was clear. Dole wasn't going to get to take too many swings at Clinton without people getting in the way. The budget shutdown that occurs from winter 95 to winter 96, you know, and from December... 95 into January 96, dominating the news and just doesn't go well for Bob Dole. He, at first, you know, Republicans are seen as forcing the president when the president stands up and takes a side, takes a stance in the showdown and doesn't give in immediately Poll numbers start shifting towards Clinton and Democrats. And Dole at first looks like he's not willing to compromise and gets dinged for that. And then when he does eventually sign a deal, it looks like he's caved. And it's so kind of a double ding for Dole in that case. So Clinton has this pretty good performance in a State of the Union in 1996. And there's a couple elements to it. Um, one is just, you know, he is a fairly good at speaking. Secondly, he introduces some of Morris's suggestions on these small issues. Now, Morris actually doesn't suggest the particular issue, which is school uniforms. This is actually something that other people, Rahm Emanuel and um, Harold Ickes, others come up with that it could be an issue that's working well in certain cities to both show family values and also to support public education in a way and to show that Democrats care about values in a way that's meaningful to them. And that is the issue of um, not re- being very careful not to require school uniforms, but to encourage schools that want to institute a school uniform policy to be able to. He makes an appearance before the State of the Union at Long Beach, California, with a public school who has had a school uniform policy in place for years and has seen violence in the school go down. If this policy makes teenagers stop killing each other over designer jackets, then public schools should be able to require School uniforms. It's something that certain school systems are trying. D.C. had over 20 schools that had school uniform policies. Pete Wilson, Republican governor, opposed to Clinton, governor of California, which, oddly enough, in 96 is going to be a key swing state. He's for school uniforms. Ed Koch, the mayor of New York, had proposed a school uniform pilot program in 1989 in New York City. This policy, by the way, that kind of got its maximum publicity in the Clinton administration has not gone away. And 25% of schools, including Philadelphia school system, Chicago school system, Cleveland school system, have some kind of school uniform policy in place today. It wasn't just about school uniforms. Clinton also throws a line in aimed at Bob Dole. I salute you. Mr. Dole, and all of the others who served this nation in World War II. It was a compliment to his opponent. It's also obviously a 
unassailable way of attacking your opponent based on their age. A, a silent bomb thrown at the opponent. No other way to describe it. No other reason to say it. And the contrast between Bill Clinton saluting his opponent and saying a lot of other things that have high poll tested qualities and then Dole gets on and attacks Clinton as elitist, attacks him for supporting a uh, garning the sport of special interest groups, calls him a figure of the past, that he's bringing things into the past that um, it just doesn't go over well. He doesn't look presidential. Pat Buchanan, who's going to be his opponent in the primary, says, I don't think Bob Dole matched Bill Clinton in eloquence or passion. Dole was trying to be tough with Clinton because – he was getting criticism for having caved on the budget deal, but Dole comes out looking harsh. So all of these things send Dole a little bit tumbling and rise Clinton's numbers. How much is Morris responsible for all of this? Well, Morris does not come out well in the budget deal. And particularly, there's an, you know, he keeps insisting to Clinton that he has to make a deal with Republicans. And really, if it was up to Morris, versus say, Stephanopoulos or Ickes or other advisors, uh, or even Gore, Clinton would have been compromising earlier. There's a particular incident where Morris actually leaks polls to the Dole campaign, and he gets caught by a seasoned political reporter who tells the Clinton folks. And then when he's caught, he tries to blame it on Stephanopoulos. And it's obvious that the memo that he had is the same memo that goes to the Dole campaign, you know, word for word. He tries to say it's not, and then they look, line it up. And it, it's just one of many things. He's forced to apologize to Stephanopoulos. The aides start setting up systems and rules very quickly for dealing with this um, worse, you know. In any year, there's a lot that happens, and a lot happened in 95, but I'm not sure people will say this. I'm not sure people will say it was a great year for music. This is how we do it, Montel Jordan, Kiss from a Rose by Seal, Hootie and the Blowfish, Hold Your Hand, and All I Want to Do, Sheryl Crow, were topping the charts. There's some significant deaths from treasured people in 95. Howard Cosell, Jerry Garcia, that was a big one. Mickey Mantle, Ginger Rogers. Some births, people you may know, Patrick Bohms, Post Malone. The U.S. rescued Mexico's economy with the $20 billion aid program. It's something that Clinton fought for and his administration pushed. The Russian space station Mir greets Americans as the U.S. shuttle, U.S. space shuttle docked with the station. A nerve gas attack in Tokyo by a Japanese supreme truth terrorist cult kills eight and injures thousands. Fighting escalates in Bosnia and Croatia. But eventually in this year, warring parties will agree to a ceasefire in Dayton, Ohio and sign a peace treaty. Israelis and Palestinians agree on transferring the West Bank to Arab control, but the cost of that deal? Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is assassinated by a Jewish extremist while he's at a peace rally. Probably, though, the significant event in America besides the Republican takeover of the House and Senate and Clinton's steps to adjust to that and their new proposals and programs is when a terrorist car bomb blows up the block-long Oklahoma City Federal Building and Timothy McVeigh, 27, is arrested. (laughs) 
Clinton goes to Oklahoma City and... The anger you feel is valid, but you must not allow yourselves to be consumed by it. The hurt you feel must not be allowed to turn into hate, but instead into the search for justice. This president never quite getting purchase on popularity with the American people has a rare moment where all Americans are united in grief and goes to a state that frankly didn't vote for him, probably had no chance of voting for him again, and makes a powerful speech. You have lost too much, but you have not lost everything. And you have certainly not lost America. That plays to his strength, that is seen as uniting the country, healing the country. After it, 57% in polls say that Clinton's performance is fair. My fellow Americans, a tree takes a long time to grow. And wounds take a long time to heal. How do you describe a squiggly line? But if you go to the Gallup poll rings, and they have them for all the presidents on their website, all the historic presidents, from Truman to Biden. And Clinton's is is odd. It's A lot of presidents will start high and then drop down. Clinton's doesn't start that high. With Bill Clinton, it starts sort of high, 58%. You have to remember that there were three candidates, and a majority of people in the 92 election pulled the lever for someone else. And then it drops to 38% in the middle of the year. Why? Because Clinton gets a haircut and stories get out that he's using this fancy designer, uh, Krista Fay, that it's charging him 300 bucks and he's holding up traffic in the airport. They're going to look at that later and find that oh, at, at most one plane was held up. But that story alone drops him to 38%. His disapproval ratings are also high throughout his presidency. So it's a very stormy ride in the polls. The squiggle line goes up and down throughout his presidency, particularly the first term, and it stays in the 50s for most of that first term. His first term average is 50 points. Second term, it's going to go up to 61, but that's not where we are yet. A lot of people just think, this is a guy who's going to be in here for a while. What he's saying doesn't matter much. He's all over the place. One Democratic congressman who gets mad that he switches on the balanced budget issue says, you know, if you just wait long enough, he'll come up, he'll take the position that you agree with. Everyone's talking about Bob Dole or Colin Powell's going to come in and take the White House. He's just sitting there for a while. But there are these events, some of Clinton's counter moves to the Republicans on welfare, on Medicare, on balanced budget, and the showdown with Congress over the budget where he shows resolve. He's up to 58% in the election year. It's not great. It's good. Uh, if you all be quieter, you'll hear me a little bit easier, I think. Um, I'm going to read a statement from the president. Clinton had pushed out Morris out of his political operations several times already. And his Morris would whimper when he wanted to become the Boy Scout. But in this case, in 96, his new participation with Bill Clinton would end up biting Clinton. At right at the time that he was to make his nomination speech, his renomination speech in Chicago in 1996. And it disrupted the entire event because of uh, Dick Morris was caught with a prostitute in Washington, D.C., and apparently was revealing to the woman statements that he made uh, to Clinton. He'd have her listen in on the phone when he was talking to the president. And uh, Dick it reads as follows. Uh, Dick Morris is my friend, and he is a superb political strategist. I am and always will be grateful for the great contributions he has made to my campaigns and for the invaluable work he has done for me over the last two years. It, it is a story it was somewhat of a nothing burger as a real true event, as um, this defender of Clinton says. Well, what? So, so what? In other words, the president's pushing pa family values for the country. An individual, a consultant, uh, has some difficulty. Uh, I don't know how one can attribute that to the president in any way whatsoever. It's just uh, is a connection that can't be made. 
But it was a momentum killer for and it gave a t- Republican talking point right at the point when Clinton was supposed to launch his campaign. Right now, they made a conscious effort to physically seal the president off from the story so he can concentrate on tonight's speech. There was talk about a possible jog, about a possible walkthrough here at the convention center, and we can only, only infer that they kept him wired up and no one will come between a television camera and the president until he appears here tonight. It, it's going to have, I think, two very substantial effects. Uh, the first one, obviously, is bad news for the president on his biggest day here, uh, coming just two days after they were talking about family values. It's obviously an embarrassment to, to the president and to the party. Uh, the bigger issue, I think, the bigger damage is going to be to the president's campaign. Uh, Mr. Morris, whatever his personal foibles may be, was uh, preeminently the most brilliant strategist that, that Clinton and the Democrats have. He's maneuvered Clinton from great unpopularity back to a lead in the polls, and now they're losing him. Well, Dick Morris didn't stop hurting Clinton and hurting both Bill and Hillary Clinton. Not too long after the election, he changed the title of his book from Behind the White House to to accommodate the Lewinsky scandal, He how we elected Sunday morning bill and got Saturday night bill, you know, things like that. And he'd spend quite a career attacking the Clintons thereafter and continues this day. Um, he was a opponent of Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. He advised, not officially, but there were phone calls between him, as far as we know, and Donald Trump. He predicted that Donald Trump would win the 2020 election. He predicted Donald Trump would win 2016. On that, he was right predicted that Donald Trump would win the 2020 election was wrong. And I think it's uh, somewhat important to talk about Dick Morris only because there has been talk that he's been speaking to Donald Trump again. Uh, So, you know, then it's important to isolate, well, how much did Dick Morris really do for Bill Clinton? And I do think 96 works a little bit if you're looking for 2024. Again, no no one election matches another election. But if you want to understand what's probably going to need to happen, if Trump would engineer a comeback, um, it's been awfully quiet. I think for all of the talk that people had said, this guy's never going away, unless you're specifically following Trump, uh, he has gone away. Okay, yes, the cancellation of the account on Twitter due to the events of 1-6 is, is certainly a factor. Um, I don't know if it would be the same without it. It does appear that the presidency is that bully pulpit that Theodore Roosevelt quoted it to be. And you gain certain publicity points when you have the White House. And if you're one party or the other, you always want to have that presidency because you're going to have the focus of the country for some time. This shows it. You know, we're really not spending a line, a lot of time talking about a figure that we spent a lot of time talking about. So that's either a natural force or it's a strategy. And if it's a strategy, you know, that's a pretty smart one if you're in that position. Keep quiet. Got the midterms coming, and you have ample time in the year 2023 to start talking. And one of the people that he could be listening to, or not, is Dick Morris. And if he is, well, the only thing I'll say is he'd need to have as good of a filter as Bill Clinton did, and adjustable political skills, as Bill Clinton did, and the ability to switch on issues, even issues that are important to him, and say things that may not always be his own opinion, for it to work. That's an open question. Does he have those skills? Does he have that patience? That's an open question. I want to thank you for listening to the website. It's www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We do have the Patreon, patreon.com slash mhcbuyp. And if you like the program, please tell someone else about it. That helps. Thanks for listening.